This video was made in association with KnifeInformer.com. Head on over to KnifeInformer for all of your blade-related needs, including reviews, comparisons, stats, and more. What is up everybody and welcome. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at this Steve Skiff Accomplice. This knife is super sweet and comes to us on loan from my friend Mike. Now, I've been very excited to try out a knife from Steve. Um, this one is actually the same Accomplice that many of you may have already seen on Walking Reviews. That knife was loaned to Jim from Mike as well. And I managed to pick this up from Mike at New York Custom Knife Show, where I also got to meet Steve Skiff and try out his knives there. So that was pretty cool. So let's go ahead and jump into it, guys. Before we hit the features and flaws, let's check out the stats on this knife. First up is going to be the overall length. So as you guys can see here, we are looking at just about eight and a half inches right at about eight and a half inches. So um, pretty reasonable size, a little bit bigger, but uh, nothing too crazy, nothing quite in bodega territory. So let's give you guys a sense of what that's like versus the paramilitary two and the rat two. Let's see here. So you guys can see it absolutely dwarfs the rat. Um, there's really no contest there. And then compared to the PM2, uh, it does have a little bit of length on it, and it is going to be notably thicker than a PM2, which is something to point out, and not something that you can particular, particularly see at this angle. Um, the useful cutting edge versus the PM2 is actually pretty similar in terms of uh, overall length. However, the skiff's cutting edge does not actually start until right where the uh, nail of my pinky is, which is kind of right where... It lines up with the PM2, and then you know the PM2 is a little bit shorter on the tip here, um, but kind of outside of that, they're they're very comparable. And then overall, you can see the sort of tallness of the knife, while it takes place in sort of different areas of the knife, it's very similar to a PM2. So pretty reasonable size all around. Although this is um, you know going to be one of those thicker customs. So let's go ahead and check out the weight as well. All right, so let's see here. Now, again, this is going to be a bigger knife, though. It is on standoffs, so, um, you know, let's see what uh, some titanium and carbon fiber weighs at this size. I'm going to say something, yeah, around 5.5 ounces is what I was going to say. So at 5.29 ounces, it's not too crazy, um, but you do need to know that this maybe isn't, uh, you know, the most practical light EDC. And it's definitely more so of, you know, one of those fatter, fancier customs. Um, and so I think, honestly, 5.29 ounces is a completely reasonable weight for a knife that kind of punches in this in this category. Um, you know, if you compare this to something like a Lorevo, of which I now own three, more on that later, um, but uh, if you compare it to something like that, the Lorevos, they weigh a lot more. They are a little bit thicker, and they do tend to, you know, this is all titanium and carbon fiber, whereas the Lorevos that I have have some steel in them as well which really adds to the weight as well as having backspacers. So you can see that, you know, for the size and for what you're getting, it's actually a pretty reasonable weight. But uh, you should know that it is kind of beyond that four and a half ounce zone. So let's go ahead and check out the features and flaws on this knife. Okay, so first things first with checking out the features and flaws, I want to go over sort of the materials and, and do a little bit of a showcase of this knife. Now, as some of you may be familiar, Tamascus is a particularly uh, fingerprint prone uh, material, so uh, I've been handling this knife a lot recently, so I'm just going to get a little bit of a microfiber polish going on in some of this Tamascus, and I should be able to show this off to you guys. The finishing that uh, Steve has pulled off on this Timascus in particular is really, really strong. Very clean, very crisp, and quite, quite shiny. Clean up the blade a little bit here as well. So I'm going to get up close with the camera here and just kind of give you guys a little bit of an overview of what we have. So the first thing to notice are these beautiful Timascus bolsters. And I'll just let the light play off those a little bit for you. Now, it is worth noting that the bolster Timascus is a completely different uh, Timascus than what the clip is made from. 
So you can see on the bolster we have this kind of really thin oval pattern. A little bit more orange showing through on the lock side versus a very, very dense purple and blue on the show side. Though you do get a little bit of that orange twinge up towards the top here. Guys, I am trying to do a better job of holding the knives a little bit more steady in the videos for you. So let me know how this is. But uh, as we move to the clip here, you can see we transfer from, I don't know, what I presume is a traditional Timascus to what becomes a white Timascus here. And uh, you get much darker purples and blues in this particular clip, uh, as well as the yellow and white kind of striking through. You can see it's a much different pattern as well. And there is some milling through the center here. I think the Timascus on this knife is absolutely gorgeous. You know, Timascus is a pretty cool material on its own, but it needs to be finished properly. Um, and there's been a lot of times where I've run into Timascus that wasn't finished quite as well. Uh, the Jason Guthrie Ranger that I had recently, his Timascus was so thin uh, and so curved and everything that it didn't seem to want to take a good finish uh, as well. Something that has a little bit more thickness. Now, I'm not even close to being an expert. I don't know what the reason for that is, but it was something that I noticed that, you know, that it was different. Uh, and that you really can have different levels of finishing on Timascus, and it matters how well you do. Uh, let's take a quick look at the blade here. You can see the beautiful hand rub satin finish, high polish flats. They're, they're borderline mirror. In fact, they might just not even be cleaned enough. They might be full mirror, but I think it's mostly just a high polish. Uh, beautiful swedge here though, I really like this. See the IKBS logo. And uh, one other interesting feature with the aesthetics here. Oh, might need a flashlight for this one. Is that you can see jeweling all through the interior, which is something I greatly appreciate. Big fan. Did a really good job with that. And that's all the way through the liners. And of course we just have a nice traditional pivot. Anodized blue. Very, very pretty. So uh, let's go ahead and actually start talking about some of these features and flaws here. First of which is going to be the ergonomics. This knife has really solid ergonomics as long as you can live with a big knife. And if you are comfortable with that, um, you know, it really melts away in the hand. It does a really, really good job of that. There's very heavy contouring. Well, I, actually, that's not really true. I wouldn't call it heavy contouring. There's some nice light contouring along the handle here, um, but really everything is just so chamfered and smoothed out. You can see there's really, really steep chamfer all the way around, super rounded edges. And uh, the overall kind of shape of the handle just does a really good job to melt away in the hand. So you can see the thickest chunk of the handle is kind of this section here. Uh, and that fits right into the deepest part of the uh, part, you know, the deepest part of your palm insofar as uh, this sort of area here is kind of the most shallow area. And that's where this thicker spot kind of wants to hang out. So very solid there. Your finger is uh, comfortably tucked away up against the flipper tab right here for protection. And again, it is super smoothed out and everything. So no worries with sliding forward or anything like that. Your fingers, uh, they do like to fall in naturally up here. The uh, ring finger here is a little bit on this hump. Um, and I don't feel that as much because I still have some of this nerve damage in this area. So kind of take what I'm saying with a grain of salt as far as how this feels up against the middle finger here. But ultimately it does feel like it falls away. I feel like I could have a bigger hand and there's still a little bit of space on the end here for where I could fit. So it does seem to fit, you know, multiple different hand sizes. I'm, I'm kind of like a medium, which is good. And your thumb does naturally comfortably sit right here on this jimping. 
which functions. Um, it's not the best, but it is nice and smooth, so at least it's comfortable, and you can bear down on it if you really need to. The last thing to say about the ergonomics is that, you know, the clip is very long. It is pretty large, um, but it still does a good job of melting away in the hand because it's uh, the profile, uh, or sorry, the footprint, rather, is is relatively thin. It's very slim. Uh, it's nice and straight, so you don't feel like a weird curvy thing in your hand. Um, and, you know, it kind of just really falls. You can see this uh, crease in my hand here is right where it rotates when I want to hold it. So it's just sitting right here in this little crux, uh, and that's really comfortable. You know, a clip can be a big thing in terms of ergonomics, and, uh, you know, despite the rather large size on this one, it actually functions very well. And so having said that, that kind of takes me into the next section in the features and flaws, which is the clip. Now, it is a little bit strong due to it being Damascus, but the length uh, sort of gives it the necessary give to be comfortable to use. Um, it's got really good retention. It's pretty easy in and out of the pocket. A little bit of a two-hander just because um, you do have kind of a shallow ramp. And it is that stronger Timascus. You can see it doesn't really want to budge here with my fingernail. So it is a bit of a two-hander, but it is going to feel very clean and smooth in and out, very consistent. Um, and, you know, I don't personally like clips this large on knives. On this particular knife, the aesthetics are really good. I think that it kind of fills up this carbon fiber scale very well. And uh, I think that the uh, Damascus pattern did very well to follow the flow of the clip overall. Um, and so on this particular knife, it doesn't bother me quite as much, but in general, I'm not as big of a fan of these larger clips. Um, and so that's just kind of a personal preference thing. Take that for what it is. But uh, on this particular knife, it hasn't gotten in my way in the same way that other large clips have. Moving on to the next uh, aspect of the knife, I want to talk about the action. And we are going to break this into two different sections. Of course, the deployment and the closing. So first, let's talk about deployment on this knife. Now, this has one of the best deployments that I've experienced to date. Um, outside of South Africa, it has one of the better lockup sounds that I've heard. Do that right up against the mic. Really, really solid sound. Quite loud. And uh, very clean, very snappy, very authoritative, um, just a really delightful noise uh, that the knife makes when it uh, deploys. It's very consistent, um, and it's really hard to get deployment to fail on this knife. Um, you can see if I just kind of drag my finger over the flipper tab until we eventually catch it. You can see here it takes the least amount of effort that you could have to get the knife deployed. It's all in that detent, very consistent, and uh, it really doesn't take much. Now, you can kind of fat finger it with your thumb if you really want it to make it fail, uh, but anytime you're using that index finger, amazing. It's just so clean. It's just really, it's different. Um, I have to say, it is a different deployment than I've experienced on another knife. You know, usually when I get a knife, I'm kind of able to compare it to something else that I've tried. Um, part of that might just be the rampage of South African makers that I've gone on, but um, generally, you know, knives have both a little bit of uniqueness to the way they feel, um, but then also can kind of be like, well, you know, if you've tried this, you would like this. Uh, and I have difficulty making that comparison with this knife because the deployment is so unique. Now, this particular knife is running on IKBS. Uh, Steve and his team are moving to a proprietary um, bearing system. That's something that I learned when I was at uh, New York Custom Knife Show. They had some knives there that were on the new pivot, pivot system, and they had some that were on IKBS. Um, I don't think that's really going to change anything about how the knife functions, quite frankly. Uh, but generally, IKBS is going to be smoother. I think they might be doing that for, for maybe saving money or something like that. I'm not sure. I didn't ask. Um, but that is something to note that, uh, the bearing system on these knives will be different, uh, depending on how new the knife is that you purchased. But, um, yeah, there's just something about that snappiness, um, and that consistency and the way that it feels is just, uh, it's very different than other knives that I've tried. It's very glassy. Um, you know, I think a lot of people like to say 
that uh, an action feels like two pieces of glass with like oil between them. Um, and I think that when people say that, what they're trying to just get across is how incredibly smooth a knife is. Um, whereas on this particular knife, I would I would wager that that's actually what it feels like. Specifically, that it feels like two pieces of glass against one another. Um, I know that I'm maybe going droning on about this a little bit too long, but it's something that I really wanted to focus on because it's not often that you know a knife kind of either really confuses me or. Um, or just, you know, that I get to experience something particularly unique. So I think it's really important that I that I kind of dish on uh, the deployment of this knife for a little bit because there's something about it that is very special and there's something about it that is uniquely skiff. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to perhaps own a knife that has some, some unique flavor to it in the same way that a Gavco action has unique flavor to it um, – then, then this is going to be great for you. This has, has a lot going for it in terms of the deployment department that I'm a really, really big fan of. Having said that, um, it's kind of not as all happy, happy, joy, joy in the closing department. Um, and I don't know why. So <laughs> my notes specifically state uh, that this is probably the most confusing area of the knife. The closing action is incredibly smooth, but it's not very free. So you can see here, I don't have to shake it with much effort and it does kind of move with every shake, but it moves only a small amount. And it's really, I don't know, it's kind of, I can't place my finger on why. So um, if you think of some of the, the normal reasons that a knife doesn't want to fall shut as well, uh, one can be, you know, a lack of oil. Uh, I know that this knife is oiled. Um, another can be, you know, the way that the detent ball contacts the, uh, blade tang, but, um, upon investigation, it's a pretty, pretty standard ceramic ball in there. Um, and you know, the deployment's really great. So I don't think anything is really up with that. Um, and then of course the lock bar tension, this lock bar isn't weak at all. I mean, it's on the stronger side, but I have stronger lock bars that allow for, for a smoother closing action. So I can't figure out what it is that holds this knife back from being able to sort of free fall. Um, the pivot's not overly tight. You know, I did play with the pivot a little bit. Um, and, and this was kind of the, the best uh, action that I could get out of adjusting the pivot. And so I'm just really unsure about it. Now, if you give the knife a reasonable flick, it pretty much drops shut. You know what I mean? It's not hard to shake. It does not, it's not fighting you. That's the part that I just can't, I'm like frustrated trying to give this uh, review because I should be able to tell you why it's this way and I just, I just can't figure it out. Everything, all signs say that this knife should be dropping exactly like a Thorburn. It's IKBS, it's very similar finishing work, it's got a very similar detent setup, um, it deploys very similarly to a Thorburn in terms of consistency, authoritativeness, um, and, and just everything says that it should be dropping more smoothly. And the weird thing is, if you have a knife that, uh, let's say the lock bar tension is too strong, that's like what you've got on this pinstripe here. This has a super strong lock bar and a really light uh, uh, blade. So when you go to shake it shut, you know, you kind of have to shake it. And you can shake it hard and it'll fall all the way. And you can shake it lightly and it'll fall parts of the way. And that's how this knife acts, but it doesn't have the same characteristics that should make it act that way. And again, I can get it to close fully without too much effort. Kind of like a Lambert in that way. But again, I just feel like this thing should want to pull itself shut. It's a nice big blade. And it doesn't. So that's all the more I'm gonna dwell on that, guys. Um, I just, you should know that I don't know why that is, but that is the way it is. Um, and it is worth noting that I picked up every single knife on Steve's table at New York Custom Knife Show, and they were all exactly like this one. They all deployed like some of the best deploying knives I've ever handled, and they were all 
the same effort to shake shut. Um, so, you know, this knife's not a fluke or anything like that. They were all exactly like this one. Um, and I, I just don't know why. So let's go ahead and move on uh, to the blade. Now, the blade steel on this knife, uh, we're not sure. So I asked the owner, Mike, and he said uh, that Steve's default steel when you order a knife is CPM 154. Uh, and that that's what he bets this is, but that he's not actually sure. He doesn't have the paperwork to check. Um, and so we don't really know what blade seal we're working with, but there's a pretty good chance that it's CPM 154. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, you have a really, really beautiful hand rub satin finish. Something that uh, I'm sure you guys have noticed by now, I really like on my South African customs. Definitely one of my favorite, if not my favorite blade finish. And then these high polished flats. Gorgeous. Uh, the edge here, this knife is not mine. I haven't cut anything with it. But uh, looks like a pretty solid, relatively tall edge. And uh, the overall shape, pretty, pretty standard. Um, I don't think anything here is going to surprise you guys. We do have a hollow grind, so this knife's going to make an excellent slicer. And uh, I do believe the swedge is hollow. Let me give me let me give that a look. Uh, hollow, but on such a small degree that it's very difficult to see. But so you do have a hollow swedge as well, which I really like. I like this sort of harpoon look. It's a little far back to be a harpoon, I suppose. But I mean, it it is a harpoon. I like that. And uh, yeah. That's pretty much going to cover it. So in the sort of miscellaneous section for this knife, there were a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, one was that, uh, you know, this has the internal uh, jeweling, which I pointed out earlier. And then another is that it is on standoffs, as I mentioned before. Now, while standoffs are a great weight-saving technique, I've always preferred backspacers over standoffs on bigger, more expensive customs like this. Um, that's just kind of like a personal preference thing. Standoffs on a knife like this... They feel to me like a cop-out, even though they aren't. So let me be ultra clear here um, that I don't view them as a cop-out. That doesn't make sense. Um, they're a totally viable way to save weight on a big knife like this. A lot of people have complained on bigger knives that they want them to weigh less. Um, standoffs are a completely reasonable solution to building a knife. Um, I just personally have the personal opinion that... Um, they're not a great option on a full-blown custom like this. Uh, when you have these really deluxe materials, this really deluxe sort of size and thickness to the overall knife, um, I don't necessarily feel like the half ounce of weight or ounce of weight that you save by not putting something back here and, you know, using those heftier measurements, I'm talking about something like steel um, or Timascus or something like that, but you could even do G10 um, or or anything. Carbon fiber, you know, would match the scales here and everything. I just think that uh, backspacers are just a better thing on full-size customs, and again, that's just a personal opinion, um, but I'm not a big standoff guy, so I did want to point that out. Um, and so that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see beautiful pictures of all these knives, you can do so by following me on Instagram at Works. And of course, if you'd like to reach out to me for any reason whatsoever, you can do so by emailing me at TovarishWorks at gmail.com. Again, guys, I am trying some new things with a new format for the channel, and I am trying to sort of slow my hands down, be a little bit more deliberate with my movements. So do please leave feedback on how that's working out for you guys. And thanks so much. I will see you next time.